Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our second part of our study on the seven churches of Revelation. Before we begin, let's commit this time to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your precious word. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that brings life and light to your word and through it to our souls. We ask you now, Lord, to bring revelation to our hearts and minds through your word. For we ask it in Jesus Christ's precious name. Amen. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation and chapter 2. The book of Revelation, chapter 2. And we're going to be reading from verse 1 through to verse 7. Revelation chapter 2, verse 1. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works, and thy labour, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and has found them liars, and has borne and has patience for my name's sake, and has laboured and has not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come to thee quickly, and will remove thy lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh, I will give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Praise the Lord. Thank you for your word, Lord. Now then, as we embark upon this first letter, as it were, to the seven churches, I want us to look at some background information. I think it would be an advantage to look at some of the background information about both the city and also its inhabitants. I think it would be helpful for our needs, so let's do that. The city of Ephesus was situated about three miles from the western coast of what is today Turkey. But then it was known as Asia. Asia Minor. It was also near the mouth of the Kaista River, which flowed from Baydag in what is today Izmir, some 114 kilometres, that's about 17 and three quarter miles, down to the Aegean Sea at Pamukkak Beach near Sejuk, which is also in Izmir. In modern-day Turkey. The church at Ephesus was one that was planted by the Apostle Paul, which we'll take a look at shortly in Acts 19. It was though also where the Apostle John had a home. Now John would have had some oversight of this church while he was there. He would no doubt have been the Apostle John who helped the growth of the young pastor Timothy in the absence of the Apostle Paul. Now, Ephesus itself was the most important of all the seven churches listed by John here in this letter. Although Pergamum was the official capital of the province of Asia, it was the geographical position of Ephesus that made it more important due to the fact that all of the trade done by sea 
would have passed through Ephesus. There was also a Roman proconsul seat there, which made it an assize town or a seat of government, if you will. And as a result, it enjoyed the right to a certain amount of self-government by the Romans. The town clerk, or sometimes called the city recorder, was someone who held great authority in the city. He would have been in charge of all the archives of the city. It was his responsibility to explain or teach or even enforce the law of the city. And this brings us nicely now to our uh, look at Ephesus in Acts chapter 19. Turn with me, if you will, to Acts chapter 19. We're going to read a few verses here from verse 24 to verse 40. And this will give us an idea of what was going on at the time. Acts chapter 19, verse 24, through to verse 40. Verse 24. For a certain man named Demetrius, a silversmith, which made silver shrines for Diana, brought no small gain unto the craftsmen, whom he called together with the workmen of like occupation, and said, Sirs, you know that this craft we have our wealth. By this craft we have our wealth, sorry. Moreover, you see and hear that not alone at Ephesus, but almost throughout all Asia, this Paul, this is the Apostle Paul, hath persuaded and turned away much people, saying that they be no gods which are made with hands. So that not only this craft is in danger to be set at naught, but also the temple of the great goddess Diana should be despised, and her magnificence should be destroyed from all Asia, and the world worshippeth. And when they heard these sayings, they were full of wrath and cried out, saying, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. And the whole city was filled with confusion. And having caught Gaius and Articus, men of Macedonia, Paul's companions in travel, they rushed with one accord into the theatre. And when Paul would have entered in unto the people, the disciples, disciples sorry, suffered him not. And certain of the chief of Asia, which were his friends, sent unto him, desiring him that he would not adventure himself into the theatre. Some therefore cried one thing and some another, for the assembly was confused, and the more part knew not wherefore they were come together. In other words, they didn't know why they were there. And they drew Alexander out of the multitude, and the Jews put him forward, and Alexander beckoned with the hand, and would have made his defence unto the people. But when they knew that he was a Jew, all with one voice, about the space of two hours, cried out, Great is Diana of the Ephesians. You can imagine hearing that for two hours straight. And when the town clerk had appeased, town clerk, sorry, had appeased the people, he said, You men of Ephesus, what man is there that knoweth not how that the city of the Ephesians is a worshipper of the great goddess Diana, and of the image which fell down from Jupiter? Seeing then that these things cannot be spoken against, you ought to be quiet and to do nothing rashly. For you have brought hither these men, which are neither robbers of churches, nor yet blasphemers of your goddess. Wherefore, if Demetrius and the craftsmen which are with him have a matter against any man, the law is open, and there are deputies. Let them implead one another. But if you inquire, inquire anything concerning other matters, it shall be determined in a lawful assembly. For we are in danger to be called in question for this day's uproar, there being no cause whereby we may give an account of this concourse. And when he had thus spoken, he dismissed the assembly. Now this, of course, was 
is the riot which occurred in the city as a result of the preaching and teaching of, of the Apostle Paul. Now these silversmiths were upset because the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, which was being preached and taught by Paul, was a threat to their living and businesses. The worship of the goddess Diana was the overwhelming religion of the city. And the temple to her, which was originally dedicated to Artemis, dominated the city. Now this goddess Diana was represented by a multi-breasted female statue, many of which were made by the silversmiths to be sold in the city. That would be miniatures, of course, along with miniatures of the temple itself. These would be sold in the markets to travellers and to visitors and, of course, to pilgrims coming to see the wondrous temple and they would come from all over the known world. Now, the religion around the worship of Diana was a pagan one, obviously. So as a result of the powerful influences of this temple and its religion, Ephesus became the chief centre for necromancy, exorcism and many other forms and types of magic arts in the whole of Asia. Now the Apostle Paul lived and ministered here in Ephesus for three years, according to scripture, planting, building and encouraging the young church there, against the backdrop of all this paganism and debauchery. Paul also wrote a letter to the church of Ephesus, which we have in the canon of scripture, book of Ephesus, Ephesians. And in it, Paul addresses a predominantly Gentile church at that time. And he seeks to encourage them in four different areas in his letter to the Ephesian church. And these are the four areas generally that he addressed. First of all, to make sure that they have a clear understanding of the plan of salvation through redemption. A plan set out by God from before the foundation of the world. Secondly, to make sure they were aware of the enormity of the blessings they had received, but also to be aware of the responsibility they had as a result of them. I think that's something that we can all ponder. Thirdly, to lead them to a greater understanding of the spirit of the gospel, not just the word, the spirit of the gospel. And that means that there was now no difference between Jew and Gentile in the kingdom of God. So as a result, all were to be conformed to the likeness of Christ into one body, no longer Jew and Gentile. They were to be conformed to the likeness of Christ into one body. And fourthly, to encourage them all to live worthy of the name to which they had been called, as sons and daughters of the living God. And as such, bringing honour and glory to his holy name. Now, if you think about those four areas that Paul covered in the book of Ephesians, the letter to the Ephesian church, I think those are things that we can all ponder regularly. Now let's look a little closer at the letter to the church of the Ephesians. The church at Ephesus. The letter to the church at Ephesus. This is what we are focusing on today. And now that we've laid a foundation, as it were, let's now begin to look in a little more depth at this important message from God to this church in Asia, in Ephesus. The Revelation chapter 2, verse 1 recovering, uh, 
recounting what we read earlier, says this, And to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks, or as we saw in the uh, first chapter last time, lampstand, golden lampstands, the menorah, of course. There were no candlesticks in those days. Now, as I explained in the introduction to this series last time, the addressing of the letter to the angel of the church does not mean a literal angel. It rather means the spirit-filled, God-ordained pastor or elder who is responsible to God for the spiritual well-being of that particular flock. For this particular congregation in this respect. And knowing as the Apostle James writes about the responsibilities of leadership in the church, we read in James chapter 3 verse 1 the following. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. I'm going to read that again. My brethren, be not many masters, knowing that we shall receive the greater condemnation. Now, we, at the beginning of each of the seven letters, there is a greeting from the risen Lord Jesus to each church. In each particular, each is a particular facet of the character and power of the Lord expressed. Each one, as we will see, addresses a particular problem within that church. But keeping in mind that this, these particular letters are addressed to the leaders of these particular churches. And as I just read in James 3 verse 1, the leaders of the churches shall receive a greater condemnation. Not only are leaders responsible to God for their own spiritual condition, their own place and position before God, they're also responsible for the spiritual welfare of the flock under their care. That's why it says, we shall receive the greater condemnation before God. And leaders of churches need to remember that fact. Now here, going back to our, our letter here in the address to Ephesus, the Lord declares that he holds the seven stars in his right hand and that he walketh in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. Now the words that we have translated, he that holdeth, are actually one Greek word. That wo word is krateo, krateo, which means to use strength, that is to seize or retain, to hold fast, to keep, to lay hands on, to obtain, to retain, to take. And I think you'll agree this gives the wording a much stronger sense than just being sitting in an open hand. Now the words translated who walketh are the single Greek word peripateo, which itself means to tread all around, that is to walk at large. It means to live amongst or to follow, to, to be occupied with, to walk about. In other words, this particular wording of Jesus is painting a a picture of someone who has both a firm grip upon and is also very intimately involved with and present with his sheep. As we see here in these following verses in John 10 verses 28 and 29. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, 
which gave them me is greater than all and no man is able to pluck them out of my father's hand and next we have revelation chapter 2 verse 2 following on i know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not and has found them liars. Now, because the risen Christ is so intimately involved in and present with his church, he knows exactly what is going on within it. Here Jesus makes this fact clear to this church in Ephesus. Sadly, this is a snare that is easy for any fellowship to fall into if they are serious about the word of God and it's a tool that Satan uses sometimes to devastating effect to steer a fellowship away from the narrow way. He uses a good and even godly desire to protect the flock from of God from error. He does this by ensuring that this desire becomes an obsession thus taking the emphasis away from the worship of God and the advancement of the gospel and onto heresy hunting as it can be called. Protecting the flock from error is indeed important but it should not become the main focus of a church or leadership or individuals. Now the church at Ephesus had, in be, had indeed been vigilant in all their work to expose those who were false as we can see as we read in verses 2 and 3 and they had not faltered in this respect to losing their faith in the Lord. However the Lord Jesus sees a problem as we see in the following verse Revelation chapter 2 verse 4. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. They left their first love. I want us to look for a, a time at this first love. What is exactly our first love? What does it mean? Well, yes, it does of course mean our love for the Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, for the whole Godhead. However, it means much more than this. It doesn't solely mean that. I wonder if you remember way back when you were first saved. That first day after it happened when everything was new, the sky seemed bluer, the birds were singing sweetly. You just wanted everyone around you to know about this wonderful new life that was available through the risen Lord Jesus Christ. You just couldn't wait to get into a meeting and worship the Lord, to hear the word of God, to pray and to fellowship with other believers, other like-minded believers. This is our first love. I wonder, do you still have that first love? Do you still live like that? Are those the feelings that drive you? If you've been saved for a long time, like my wife and myself, some 34 years at the time of writing this message, many things will have happened. There may have been work problems, difficulties with children, money problems, health problems, or even splits caused by differences of opinion on doctrine and so on and so forth. Plus there can be occasions where we may be for a time be deceived by false teachers or preachers and so on. All of these things and more are par for the course as a Christian in this world. When you sit back and think about things you will see that it's very easy to be drawn away from that first love. There may be many who hear this message 
they may find themselves in that position that Jesus highlights here at Ephesus. And it would be easy to get downhearted and even anxious and depressed to realise that you've slipped away from that wonderful first love. You know, love is such an important quality. So much so that Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote an entire chapter about it to the believers at the church in Corinth. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 verses 1 to 13. We're not going to read it now, but read it for yourself. So important is love, the love of God, that the Apostle Paul writes a whole chapter about it. Jesus himself also made much of it in his final great prayer to the Father, culminating in this last verse in John 17 and verse 26. And I have declared unto them thy name, and will declare it, that the love wherewith thou hast loved me may be in them, and I in them. However, Jesus didn't leave things there. He presented the believers with a way back, as indeed he does for all of us, when we realise our error. And I want to look now at a way of escape that Jesus lay down there to the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 5, our next verse. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first works or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of his place except thou repent. Jesus tells them, and in fact us, by the way, the only way to put things right, and that is to recognise and accept that we have deviated from the narrow way. And repent, a word not heard or even obeyed or even talked about much today, repent to turn around, to, to turn around 180 degrees, forget what has gone before and head in another, in a, the proper direction. This is not a one-off thing, by the way. It's something that should be addressed on an ongoing basis as a believer. Now the word remember in our verse there in verse 5, Revelation 2 verse 5, says, Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen. That word remember in this verse is the Greek word nomeno, nomeno, which means to exercise memory, that is to recollect, and by implication to punish, also to rehearse, to make mention of, to be mindful, remember. The Greek imperative of this word is to keep on remembering. It's not a one-off. It's a continuous sense. Keep on remembering, therefore. And the word fallen is the Greek word ekpipto, ekpipto, which means to drop away, to drop out of one's course, to lose to become inefficient, to be fall away, to be cast off, to be of non effect. And that's what happens when we, go, we fall away from the straight and narrow way, when we lose that first love. We fall away from the faith. The word repent there is the word metaneo, metaneo, and it means to think differently, or afterwards that is to reconsider, morally to feel compunction, to repent. 
So it's, it's remembering where you once were with the Lord. How far we've fallen from that wonderful state of grace that we had when we first were saved. And we do something about it. We think differently. We act differently. We repent to the Lord. The idea is here that as soon as you become aware that something is wrong, you change. You come before the Lord and you put it right. You do this by making a clean and decisive break with whatever it was that was wrong in your life. And the consequences for not putting things right are dire, as you'll see from the latter part of this verse. And Jesus goes on, he says, Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy lampstand out of his place, except thou repent. Now let's look at removing the lampstand. What does it mean? What does it mean for Jesus to remove his lampstand out of his place? Well, to understand the, the ramifications of this, we need to refer back to the first chapter of Revelation that we covered in the last message. Now, it can be summed up somewhat briefly as the anointed presence and involvement of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. Now this may be removed from a church fellowship and it not even be noticed because rituals and traditions will continue as normal but there will be no life of God in it. And we can see that with many dead churches. The traditions and the rituals just go on. Week after week after week after week, year after year, not realising that the spirit of the living God has departed. Ichabod is over the door. The spirit of the Lord has departed. It becomes a dead church. There will be no life of God. And as I said, it will be, in fact, a dead church. And once, brothers and sisters, this is done, it is final. And there will be no chance of regaining that life. But there, are, there is a sign of hope. In the next verse, we see some hope from the Lord Jesus. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 6 says this. But this thou hast, that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Even though the love of God for a believer is important, or should I say a vital element in our disposition, it's equally important that in our love for what is good and pure, we also have a corresponding hatred for what is evil and wrong. Now, the word Nicolaitans may be strange to some of you. The word Nicolaitan is made up really of two Greek words, uh, Nikos or Nikao and Laetis or Laos. And it means really the destruction of the people or a conquering of the people. Laetis is where we get the word laity from, people. Nikos is destruction or conquering of the, of the people. In other words, there would be those who would try to impose their thoughts or their ideas upon others forcefully. Now this you might recognise of today, where there are those who will tell you that if you do not hold to their particular ideas, say of eschatology, you are not saved. Does this sound familiar to anyone? Now this is not some kind of cult, 
but it's the type of people who, like Balaam of the Old Testament, attempted to seduce believers from the true path. Balaam attempted to seduce uh, the Israelites into the ways of the nations around them, to take wives and women, take husbands from the pagan nations around them, which would defile the, the holiness of the nation. We'll read more about these seducers when we study the letter to the church at Pergamum. However, for now we'll satisfy ourselves with the knowledge that those in the Ephesian church had lost the love of that which was good, but yet they retained the hatred of that which was evil or ungodly. Now the closing exhortation of Jesus in this letter to the Ephesian church is with this verse, Revelation chapter 2 verse 7. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Now this exhortation, or at least the first portion of it, is repeated to each of the seven churches to whom this letter is sent. You'll see it repeated as we look at each individual church. The second half of the verse contains a specific challenge to the particular church in each case. But let's begin, though, with the he that hath an ear section of this verse 7. Now, this is not the first time that the Lord had used this phrase, the Lord Jesus, that is. We also see it in the following scriptures. Now, when speaking of John the Baptist, Jesus says this in Matthew 11, verse 15. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Upon the conclusion of the parable of the sower in Mark chapter 4, verse 9, Jesus says this, And he said unto them, He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now that is repeated also in, in Luke chapter 8, verse 8, where also is the parable of the sower. And when explaining the saltiness of salt and the need for salt to retain its saltiness, talking of the church, obviously. In Luke 14, verse 35, Jesus said this, It is neither fit for the land, nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Now, brothers and sisters, these are not just idle words from the Lord Jesus. They are challenges for both the listeners then and for us now to hear what is previously said and then also seriously consider them and act upon them. So then, what was it that they were to hear and seriously consider? Well, it was, of course, what we've seen, their first love. Jesus had praised their hatred of what was false but they were totally bereft of any real love. First and foremost, the love of God, which when we were first saved, God gave us, and it gave us that glow and the need to tell everyone about the Lord. It is this agape love, this love of God, which is shed abroad to those believers from which our love for our brethren flows and also our desire to evangelize. So if we lose that love, this first love, our love for our brethren grows cold and our desire to evangelize grows cold. And it was to the loss of this that the second part of the verse was aimed. To him that overcometh I will give to eat of the tree of life 
which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Jesus again speaking, of course. Now the word overcometh is the Greek word nikau, which means to subdue, literally or figuratively, to conquer, overcome, prevail or to get the victory. It's the same word that forms the first part of the word Nicolaitans. So you can see why the Lord hates this type of person amongst his flock. Because there's no love of God. It's all about them. This word overcome is used very frequently throughout Scripture. And especially through the New Testament. It's there because there is much for any and all believers to overcome in this life. And as I've said, we will see it repeated to every other church in the seven letters. However, what was it that these believers in Ephesus were to overcome? Well, it's something that we all from time to time have to struggle with, I'm sure. I suppose it could be summed up as becoming weary in well-doing, being worn down by the cares of this world, in challenging error, or dealing with our own besetting sins or the sins of others around us. It's something that Jesus addressed when he shared the parable of the sower that were mentioned earlier, the sower of the seed. The last but one type was the seed sown among thorns. And Mark chapter 4 verse 7 says this, And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no fruit. And the expl explanation of that verse came later in that chapter, Mark chapter 4 verse 18 and 19. Jesus here explaining the parable to his disciples and explaining verse 7, the seed that was sown or fell among the thorns. And the explanation is this, and these are they which are sown among thorns such as hear the word and the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust of other things entering in choke the word and it become unfruitful. That's the explanation by Jesus of the seed that fell amongst thorns. So then, the lesson for those in Ephesus and also to those of us today living in this world is to realize that we are not where we were with regard to the agape love of God both in us and also flowing through us. We're not where we were, are we? If we look back again uh, to when we were first saved, remember that first love? We're not where we were, are we? with regard to the agape love of God, both in us and also flowing through us to others. Then we need to turn to God through the Lord Jesus Christ, repent and seek the fresh infilling of his love. The promise for those who obey are to eat of the tree of life. It was to those in Ephesus and it is to us all and that means eternal life with God and all that that entails perfection of holiness perfect peace perfect health and the opportunity to rule and reign with Christ Jesus forevermore wow what a wonderful promise that is the consequences however for not doing so are the reverse of this and if the, the Lord were to remove the lampstand from any church, those concerned would therefore be lost and cast out into utter darkness forever. 
Remember what happened to the five unwise virgins in Matthew 25 verses 1 to 13? They were cast out into utter darkness where there was wailing and gnashing of teeth. So then brothers and sisters, this has been the letter to the Ephesian church. They were given a warning to realise that they had lost their first love even though they were battling against what was false, they had lost that first love, the agape love of God for each other and for God and for those who are unsaved. This has been the study of the letter to the Ephesian church. Next time we will look at the letter to the church at Smyrna, but until then, brothers and sisters, may God bless you.